The first recognized Masonic Lodge in the world was the Kilwinning Lodge, Lodge Number Zero, or Mother Lodge of Scotland. And its origin dates back to the year 1140, when the Masons, who were building the neighboring abbey of Kilwinning, organized themselves into a guild. Scotland has been the epicenter of many events that seem to connect Freemasonry with the Order of the Knights Templar. To understand how, we will need to go back to the First Crusade, when two young noblemen fought side by side to free Jerusalem from the Turks. One, Hugh de Payen, would become the founder of the Knights Templar. The other, Henry Sinclair, a Scottish knight of Norman descent, would sire a dynasty that centuries later would be of vital importance for the birth of Freemasonry. The Order of the Knights Templar was founded in Jerusalem as a monastic and military order by Hugh de Payens and seven other knights after obtaining papal blessing. The Templars excavated the ruins of King Solomon's temple and legend has it they unearthed a fabulous treasure. Whether or not there is any truth in this legend, the fact is that soon after, they became immensely rich and powerful. Some speculate that they had recovered documents that demonstrated Jesus had left descendants, thus putting the Church of Rome on the rack, who, prompted by extortion or otherwise, granted the Templars enormous benefits. Whatever the case might be, history does tell us that on returning from Jerusalem, Hugh de Payens visited Scotland, where he established the first oratorium outside the Holy Land, on territory belonging to the Sinclair clan. One legend has it that the Sinclairs, Saint Clair in French, are Merovingian descendants of an alleged lineage stretching back to Jesus Christ. We have then a precursor of Scottish Freemasonry fighting side by side with the creator of the Knights Templar. This is the first fact in a sequence of coincidences that has given rise to a good deal of speculation. There are more curious facts. The Knights Templar became the financiers of monarchs all over Europe. A profitable but dangerous business that eventually sealed their fate. The persecution of the Knights Templar was unleashed in 1307, when Pope Clement VII, pressured by King Philip of France, who was enormously indebted to them, accused them of several heresies, including sodomy, adoration of the devil, Baphomet, and many other mortal sins. The Knights Templar were persecuted, tortured, and their order finally eliminated. Grand Master Jacques de Molay was imprisoned and tortured for seven years, after which he was convicted to life imprisonment. Faced with the verdict, de Molay, who was already 70 years old, together with his friend Geoffrey de Charnay, claimed that all their confessions had been obtained under torture and that both they and their knights were innocent. That act of bravery sealed their fate. On the night of March the 18th, 1314, both were carried to the banks of the River Seine and burnt at the stake. De Molay died facing the Cathedral of Notre Dame, praying, proclaiming his innocence, and cursing both King and Pope. But the ambitious King of France could not seize the Templars' wealth. The few knights that fled the massacre apparently carried their mythical treasure with them, and the rest was passed on to the Order of the Hospital, another religious group. One of the main havens for the surviving Knights Templar was remote Scotland, whose King Robert the Bruce had been excommunicated by the Pope. Scotland, the land of Henry Sinclair, fellow adventurer of the first Knight Templar. The saga continues. In the mid-15th century, a descendant of Henry Sinclair, the Crusader, called William Sinclair, started construction of a chapel in Rosslyn, to the south of Edinburgh. This chapel, mentioned in the bestseller, The Da Vinci Code, was supposedly built to hide the treasure of the Knights Templar in its vault. While this can't be proved, it is undeniable that the chapel is packed with Masonic and Templar symbols. 
therefore constituting the first ever site where both Masons and Templars left their imprint. Curiously enough, the tabernacle has the same distribution and dimensions of the third reconstruction of King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. The very same one that had been excavated by the Knights Temple. Finally, a direct descendant of the builder of the chapel of Roslyn, also called William Sinclair, would become the first Grand Master of Scottish Freemasonry at Kilwinning Lodge. This mother lodge is erected on the same grounds that had been visited by Hugh de Payens 400 years before, that is, on Sinclair land. How much truth is there in the theory that Freemasonry was born to preserve the secret of the Knights Templar? How closely were these organizations really related? Aren't there Knights Templar names and rituals in the York Rite of Freemasonry? Why Knights Templar and not something else? Let's recall the Mason initiation formula. Visit the interior parts of the earth. By retification, thou shalt find the hidden stone. The Knights Templar dug for years seeking something hidden. Is it all just a peculiar coincidence? It is indeed possible that both Freemasonry and the Knights Templar were intimately related from the time of their origins. But it is also plausible that they became related somewhat later, due to a simple ideological affinity, since both societies shared an anti-clerical and anti-monarchical ideology, and they both knew very well what it was like to be persecuted. Perhaps the mysterious bond between Masons and Knights Templar will never be proven, since those who know Masonic secrets are forbidden to reveal them for fear of painful torture followed by death. Such is the punishment for those brethren who reveal the secrets of the Lodge. The oath of the tenth degree of the Scottish Rite is just one of the many examples of the brutality with which Freemasonry condemns its betrayers. It concludes and in failure of this, my obligation, I consent to have my body opened perpendicularly and to be exposed for eight hours in the open air, that the venomous flies may eat of my entrails, my head to be cut off and put on the highest pinnacle of the world, and I will always be ready to inflict the same punishment on those who shall disclose this degree and break this obligation. An oath that one would think twice about before breaking. In the 17th century, Freemasonry acquired such importance that it began to make powerful enemies. Its inner circles became tighter and tighter. Its power to influence society grew in proportion to its expansion. Very soon they began to pull the strings of history. Strings that perhaps they still pull today. Anti-Catholic, Libertarian, Conspirational, all kinds of accusations have been laid at the door of Freemasonry. Their particular method of organization and their lexicon packed with mystifying words such as right, orient, apprentice and master have surely contributed to their reputation. Freemasonry is an international organization that is subdivided into lodges or independent chapters without a global governing authority. In the hierarchy of Freemasonry, there are three degrees which are taken in sequence. Apprentice, Fellow of the Craft, and Master Mason. A lodge that confers all three degrees is called a Blue Lodge, or Great Lodge, which constitutes the foundation of Freemasonry. Then there are the so-called appendages, such as the York Rite and the Scottish Rite, to reach this hallowed level, one must have first achieved the third degree, that of Master Freemason. The York and Scottish Rites offer 10 and 33 degrees respectively, with their corresponding rituals and symbols. Another offshoot of Freemasonry is the Rosicrucian Order, that does share a common origin, but also incorporates mystical elements, alchemy, 
and other philosophical principles that set it apart from what we understand by Freemasonry today. An understanding of the symbols of Freemasonry will surely help us shed some light on its true purpose and ambitions. If we look carefully enough, we will see their imprints in the most unlikely places, reminders that they have been there too, and still are. Freemason symbols convey ideas of spiritual growth, and many of them are inspired on those of the original Mason builders. The plumb line suggests rectitude, the spirit level, equality, the set square uprightness, virtue, and forthrightness. It is identified with the worshipful master. The compass symbolizes the Masonic ideals of friendship, morality, and fraternal love. When drawing a circle, the central point is the Freemason, and the circle is his world. The Freemason should live according to the principles of friendship, morality, and fraternal love. The trowel symbolizes the mortar that cements the Mason brethren. The 24-inch ruler stands for the 24 hours of the day. The hammer reminds the Masons that they should work on shaping and improving their character. The five-pointed star symbolizes the supreme being and also the five points of camaraderie, a secret that cannot be revealed. The white ram blanket represents purity. The slipper reminds Masons of their preparations for the degree. To enter the temple, they must remove their shoes and put on slippers. The point inside the circle with the two lines running parallel along it and the book above it symbolize the earth, the point, the heavens, the circle, and the two solstices, the parallel lines, which are the two main festive days of the year for Freemasons. The letter G is God, or Gautu, great architect of the universe, and is an American edition. It was first used in the USA, together with the set square and the compass, in around 1850. A very particular way of shaking hands allows Freemasons to recognize each other in secret. From what we have learned so far, the accusations and persecutions that Freemasonry has suffered seem to be due more to the prejudice and dogmatic and dictatorial institutions than to its own wrongdoing. So is Freemasonry just an innocent brotherhood that merely seeks to advance the cause of human progress? Its critics have a very different opinion. Freemasonry has been accused of practically everything ranging from constituting an atheist, anti-Catholic, and treacherous mafia, to fostering a global conspiracy to control the world through its secret power networks. The Catholic Church did not hesitate to excommunicate Freemasons. Most European monarchies decided to directly ban the order. Between 1738 and 1890, the Vatican passed 17 papal bulls condemning Freemasonry and urging its proscription. This did not deter many Christian monarchs from joining their ranks, while others fought them openly. King James III of Scotland was the first monarch suspected of being a Freemason. The first European sovereign to officially support Freemasonry was the Holy Roman Emperor Francis I, founder of the Royal House of Austria, and curiously enough, a Catholic. The monarchs of Holland, Sweden, Geneva, Zurich, Bern, Bavaria, Austria, Russia, and Prussia outright banned it. One of the main accusations levied against Freemasonry is that it works through Machiavellian means, even when its ends might be altruistic, as if the end justifies the means. But isn't this the trite self-justification used by every power group? In what way is Freemasonry different from any other powerful organization? Some authors believe that prior to the French Revolution, the Duke of Orleans, himself Grand Orient of France, bought all the wheat that he could get his hands on and either concealed it or sold it beyond the French borders in order to provoke the famine that led to the French Revolution.